everyone uh, in respect such a big audience uh, uh, it's, it's great to be sort of there although only virtually so this this talk is based on a paper i wrote about 10 years ago uh, and i recently looked at it and thought oh, there is something to that paper I, I never managed to get it published so i'm now trying to repackage it uh actually dividing it into two papers as you do and hope that the editors won't see oh i've already rejected that <laughs> if you can tell me why you think that is not worth uh, exploring further, I would actually be, be grateful for that. Maybe I'm, I'm just misguided here. Anyway, so I'll give you a bit of, bit of context for this. So at the time I was working on uh, the question how beliefs uh, should change over time when new information comes in. And I was looking at this within a Bayesian framework where we have degrees of belief. And there's a, a standard norm in, in, in Bayesianism is conditionalization, and it comes in, in different variants uh, depending on, on how you construct the evidence, uh, whether it's certain or, uh, and so on. But, but the, the problem I was working on was how to uh, sort of make conditionalization work for what are called self-locating propositions. So these are propositions not about what the world is like from a God's eye perspective, but about where or when you are uh, within a, a world. So the, the kind of belief change I was interested in is when you, when you, when like now I believe that it's Wednesday and when I wake up at night uh, after going to sleep tonight, I'll, I'll wonder, is it still Wednesday? And tomorrow when I wake up, I'll be sure it's Thursday. So that's a kind of belief change, which uh, where there are good reasons to think that conditionalization doesn't really capture what's going on here. And so I was working on, a, on an alternative rule uh, so and I proposed this rule, uh, and Chris Meacham at the same time came up with the same rule, uh, and I thought it's a really nice rule, uh, but I think Chris and I never managed to convince anyone else that that's, that's the right rule for, for updating beliefs, and I wondered why, because I never met any good objection, at least not objections I considered good, and when I talked to people, I realized that really people don't believe that there are any such rules. They don't think there are norms for how beliefs should change across time. At least that's my impression from talking to people. Rather, pe many people are attracted to this what seemingly simpler idea that at any point in time, you should simply uh, proportion your beliefs at that time to your evidence at that time. And if that's a, a good norm, we don't have to have extra rules for our beliefs to change over time. We just have this synchronic rule, proportion your beliefs to the evidence. And then I thought, okay, yeah, interesting. I have a diachronic norm and these people have a synchronic norm. And I was thinking, well, could, could both of these norms be correct? And I'm, I'm pretty convinced they, they can't both be correct. There are cases in which this synchronic norm, uh, which you now if you look at the handout is, is the evidentialist norm to proportion one's beliefs to the evidence. And there are cases where this norm clashes with my diachronic norm. And in fact, with any, I think, sensible diachronic norm. Now, the issue is a bit unclear because it depends on how we understand evidence and what it is to proportion one's beliefs to one's evidence. So that's why it, I'll, I'll go through this in some detail, trying to, to I'll, I'll give some different kinds of cases to illustrate how that clash might happen. But so this is now where this paper and this talk comes in. I, I want to sort of consider this question whether we should ad adopt diachronic norms like the norm I proposed uh, and therefore give up this evidentialist norm that we should just simply at any time proportional beliefs to the evidence or whether we should do it the other way around as people I've talked to seem to prefer. And I'll, I don't have really strong arguments, maybe that's the weak point of this paper, but I want to at least highlight that there's a good, good case to be made for dropping the evidentialist norm, which is I think significant because that norm, the, this evidentialist principle is often taken as a, an obvious platitude and as a starting point for, for discussions. Uh, uh, and so uh, I think it would be worth clarifying whether that norm is actually correct or not. Okay, so uh, I'll start with a with a handout if you, if you look here. So, so this evidentialist norm I said is the norm to proportion one's beliefs to the evidence. And I wanna say this clashes with, in fact, I have my, my particular uh, diachronic norm in mind, which I don't need for purposes of 
this talk to sort of discuss or defend in full detail. So the, most of you will be familiar with the standard simple form of conditionalization, which says that an agent, which I understand that the diachronic norm, it says that an agent's credence at, at a, a later time, at time two, right, credence at time two, in any proposition A should equal the credence at the previous time right, in a conditional on the evidence that's received at time two. We assume these are sort of successive times and the evidence comes with the second time. And to handle uh, self-locating uh, information, uh, I, I introduced this uh, transformation of the early credence function. If you think of credences as defined over possible worlds, so think of the, the credence mass as given to individual possible worlds, then what this transformation, the plus, little plus sign does, is it takes your, your earlier credence function from time one and moves it for each possible world, it moves the center where your credence goes to, to the next point in time. Or the next point where, where where information arrives, and that's that's this transformation. So you you new credence is kind of you shifted earlier credence, shifted a little bit further in time, and that's conditionalized on your new evidence. And this, I claim, handles sort of the the changes that happen when you when you go to bed and then wake up uh, later, and you're now convinced it's Thursday. If before you were convinced that when you would wake up it would be Thursday. Anyway, that, this. While self-locating information is quite important because I think the clash between evidentialism and conditionalization is harder to see if you, if you only look at cases that don't involve relevant self-locating information. But the details of that norm, uh, I think won't be important because uh, we can use this much simpler principle to illustrate the kind of clash. And this is what I call a conservative principle. So it says, if you're rationally confident in some <laughs> hypothesis H, of which you're convinced it won't change its truth value over time. So this is not something like it is Wednesday. Uh, uh, sorry, this should say at T1. So if you're rationally confident in H at T1, then you may, or maybe even should, uh, still be confident in H at the later time, as long as you have not learned anything which is relevant to that hypothesis. So this is a, a consequence of my rule, which was a consequence of conditionalization. That seems intrinsically plausible to me. And so I'll argue that in the cases I'll present, there is a clash, or there might be a clash between the evidentialist norm and this conservative principle. So this bypasses the question, what exactly is my rule and what would I really exactly say this about those cases? We can just look at this conservative principle and notice, oh, there's a clash between those two. I think sort of prima facie, equally plausible uh, principles, maybe, but at least uh, somewhat plausible principles. All right, is, I, I hope that is so, to click. so now I'll just look at three cases, uh, possible cases in which the evidentialist norm comes apart from the conservative norm, where they pull in different directions. Just to highlight that we have to have a choice. We can't just accept the evidentialist norm and the diachronic norm and say, yeah, it's all good. They're, they're compatible, because I think they're not. And as I said, this what such a clash will look like depends to some extent on how we understand evidence, right? Which uh, the evidentialist norm doesn't really settle, and there are many entirely different views of what should count as evidence uh, in, in this connection. So like, I can't really run a simple argument uh, that, that applies across the board. Well, maybe I can actually, but, but it would be, case three, I think works for pretty much any conception of evidence, but it's a weird case. So I want to begin with, with easier cases. And an easy case is case one, which, which works for certain popular conceptions of evidence. So here's the story. Uh, imagine you are building a brain in a vat duplicate of your own brain. It's something you, you like to do and you have the resources and skills to do that. And so at time one, you start doing this and at time two, uh, you're finished and you switch on your brain in a vat duplicate. And that, that is sort of a, a, a duplicate which mirrors your own brain activity from now on, right? So what, whatever you're thinking, you know, so for the, the brain in a vat is thinking as well. And now let's look at the proposition that you have had. Uh, and now I claim that you should remain confident that you have hands. This is a, a consequence of, of, of my rule that you apply this, this rule, which I've called shifted conditioning and Chris Meacham called it predecessor conditioning. Uh, so you should remain confident that you have hands. And you can see that this is arguably applied by this conservative principle because Initially, you were confident, let's assume this, initially when you started building the brain in that, you were rationally confident that you have hands. You were just an ordinary guy, right? You didn't have any special reasons to think that you're now already a brain in a vat. So initially you're confident, rationally confident you have hands. And then 
what happens as you build the brain in a bat, you don't receive any information showing that you don't have hands, right? You, you receive information maybe, but it might all be unsurprising information. It might all be information of which you knew all along you would receive it if you already had sort of formed the plan and not just execute the plan you envisage you would execute. So you learn nothing that's surprising by your own lights. Anything you learn is something, ah, yeah, now this happens now, now this thing is complete, just as I expected. So by your own lights, no surprising information comes in at all. Certainly no information where you would be, oh, oh this, this looks like that now, so maybe I don't have hands after all. So I think you can also see without applying uh, my rule that, or this shifted conditioning rule, that diachronic principles suggest you, you should remain confident that you have hands. Now, what is your evidence, however, now that you've built the brain in a bat? And arguably, your evidence is neutral on whether you have hands or not. But this is where it depends a bit on, on what you mean by evidence. And one way to, 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 to motivate this idea that your evidence now is neutral is it has sort of two, two premises. Uh, the first premise would be that uh, you and the brain in a vat that you've just built have the same evidence. Uh, if you think of evidence as something like how things seem to you, right? it, it seems to you as if you've you have hands, it seems to you as if you've just built a brain in a mat, it seems to you as if you remember sort of starting the process. And the same is true for the brain in a mat that you've just built. It seems to the brain in a mat that it's, it has hands. It seems to the brain in a mat that it has built and so on. So if you think of evidence as something like how things seem to you or how things might seem to you, if you paid attention to the question, then the brain in a mat and you have the same evidence. That would be one premise, which certainly some people would deny, but let's take that on board. And the second premise we would need is uh, what Adam Elgar calls the principle of self-locating indifference, which says that if you are confident that uh, the universe contains two locations, two places within it where the, same where the agent has the same evidence, uh, and your evidence is compatible with both of these. So you have a certain amount of evidence. You're confident this evidence is had by two people within the world. Then you should give these two locations the same uh, credence. So if we have uh, this further principle that kind of your, your evidence is neutral, the evidence that you share with the brain that is neutral between the two positions, then you get, of course, the, the consequence that uh, if you proportion your beliefs to the evidence, then you're you, you will give equal credence to the hypothesis that you have hands and the hypothesis that you don't have hands. Because within any world you give significant credence to, you've already built this brain in a vat, and within, within each of those worlds, you give equal credence to the invatted scenario and to the non invatted scenario. Now, you, you, you might resist this kind of argument for different reasons. Uh, for example, you might find this self-locating indifference principles, suspicious, especially as it's applied here to a case where, where one location is a skeptical scenario as it were, and the other isn't. I'm actually sympathetic to this response. It seems to me that skeptical scenarios should always get, get sort of lower credence. Uh, and so even if we're thinking about evidential probability, I think they should, should count for less. Uh, but it doesn't really matter because if you spell out the case correctly, really my rule says you should give credence zero to, to that skeptical scenario, to being the brain in a vet that has just been built. Uh, and, uh, but and I think it's not plausible that, uh, if, if, that the evidential probability, if your evidence is neutral between the two possibilities, is zero for one of them. Maybe it's lower, but it's not, not zero. Uh, you might also say that uh, it doesn't seem to the brain in a vat as if it has hands, because maybe seemings you might think depend on what, what's happening in the spine, and you haven't duplicated the spine. <laughs> I mean, that's a possible reaction, in which case you can change the example so that uh, you've not just created a duplicate of your brain, but also a duplicate of your whole body, right? Now you, whatever, whatever your body contributes to how things, to your evidence more, more broadly construed, uh, would, be, would be preserved in your duplicate. And if you think it matters, you can also duplicate the local environment. Right? so this brain, you know, that has in its environment, it becomes easier if, if the brain of that is now somewhat distant from you. So now you're in the room next door and the brain in a vat is no longer brain in a vat, but now it's a, a duplicate of your own person in a duplicate of your own room. And that's the thing you've created for the whole time. This is not very close to the scenario in that paper I mentioned by uh, Adam Elga, a uh, paper on Dr. Evil, I think, of what the whole title is, uh, where he considers a story where this, this guy, Dr. Evil, uh, becomes convinced that this kind of duplicate has been created of himself. 
and Elga uses the principle of evidentialism you know, without even highlighting it as a controversial or possibly controversial principle to, to argue that uh, Dr. Evil should become, should give equal credence to being the, the real person and the recently created uh, duplicate person. Uh, and so uh, many people in the, in the discussion of that paper, it has created some discussion. Uh, I think nobody has, has doubted these claims. So at least there are uh, many people out there who are sort of sympathetic to evidentialism who would say, yes, in this kind of case, maybe not with the brain and vat, but with a duplicate person with local environment, uh, you should give equal credence to the two possibilities, to whether you have hands, to, to that you have hands and that you don't have hands, uh, which I deny because and it, it goes against my, my diachronic rule and it goes against the principle of conservatism. So this is a case where I've met people who say, but clearly in this kind of case, you should give equal credence because your evidence is neutral. Your evidence doesn't tell whether you're the real person or the recently created, invented or duplicated person. Uh, and I said, no, you should. You should really be sure you have hands, uh, even if your present evidence doesn't shed light on this. Uh, and so this is a, a possible clash. And for many people I've talked to, uh, an actual clash because they endorse a version of evidentialism, uh, which, which subscribes to, to the notion of evidence that's the same for the brain of that. Uh, and you, and now I, I have some arguments, but they're of course rather unsurprising. They're the kinds of arguments you would expect that support diachronic norms. But I just want to highlight that, that to me, they have some force and I would like to know what's wrong with them. So, so if, you, if you lose your confidence in that you have hands, that something, it seems to be problematic is happening. Now, one thing that's happening is that your beliefs become less accurate in this technical sense. They become further removed from the truth because in this scenario, of course, you do have hands. Right? And initially you are highly confident in proposition that you have hands. And if you now suddenly at time T2 become unsure whether you have hands, your, your credence function has evolved from a more accurate function to a less accurate function. You now give lower credence to true propositions. And that seems a problem. It would be nice if credence, if a credence function didn't become less accurate. And you can show actually that uh, if you update by shifted conditionalization, your credence function will never become less accurate, it stays equally accurate or becomes more accurate, assuming that what you conditionalize on is true. Moreover, you can see this from the perspective of the, of the agent herself. If, you're, if you at T1 are looking ahead at what you will believe later when the, when the brain in a vat is switched on, you'll recognize that if you follow the norm of evidentialism and become unsure whether you have hands, you'll recognize that your future belief will be less accurate than your current belief. If you could plan how to update your beliefs and you, 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 your overarching aim is that your future beliefs will be as accurate as possible, as far as you can judge by your present ones, you would not plan to use the principle of evidentialism because you know that's going to make your beliefs, or you're highly confident that's going to make your beliefs less accurate. You would plan to update by shifted conditionalization because that uniquely maximizes expected future accuracy. And I think that has some pull because why should we think you should change your beliefs in a way where you would, if you're interested in having true beliefs, you would initially think that would be the wrong way uh, to change them. So this is one consideration uh, that uh, we want, the, if, if you follow the principle of evidentialism here, you become, your beliefs become less accurate and they foreseeably become so. If you were interested in maintaining accuracy, you would not want to follow the evidentialist rule yourself. Another sort of standard argument people give for, for all kinds of, uh, of norms in, in, in the Bayesian framework are Dutch book arguments. And it's not hard to show that if uh, in, in this case, as in any other case where you violate uh, shifted conditionalization, you're vulnerable to uh, a diachronic Dutch book. So this would be a, a combination of bets sold and bought at, at the different point times. Uh, that together amount to a guaranteed loss where we're assuming you, you buy and sell bets just in accordance with your degrees of belief, right? which is of course often highly unrealistic, but that's just how these Dutch book arguments work. Now. So in this case, it's quite obvious how that would work, right? You, you, you initially are confident that you have hands, so I can sell you a bet that you have hands uh, for, for a uh, relatively low price. And then later you're unsure whether you have hands, so I can buy back for you at a, at a, uh, at a, at a higher price. So, uh, 
sorry, I, sorry, we have to, have to get the prices right. So suppose you're 99% confident in your hands at time t1, right? So, uh, and here's a, a, a deal that pays $1 if you have hands and zero otherwise. So you would pay uh, 99 pence for, for me to offer you that deal, right? Sorry, cent, I, I did it with dollars. So you pay 99 cents for me to offer it to you. All right, so I got your 99 cents. Later, you're 50% confident, let's say, that you have hands because you follow the principle of evidentialism, right? So now you would offer me that bet for uh, 50 cents. So I, I sold you something, I got 99 cents, and now I can buy back for 50 cents, right? And I have a sure profit. And you could see that profit coming, right? You could see coming that if you bet in accordance with your, your credences, you would undergo this change that uh, amounts to sure loss. We don't even have to do what's usually done in, in these sort of diachronic edge books. We, we have, don't have to look at conditional banks or anything like this because you, your change in belief is entirely foreseeable. It doesn't even depend on what you learn because we can just assume you don't learn anything of any relevance. And now what does that show? <laughs> this is the general question with these Dutch book arguments. Do they show anything? And some people think we know they're just, well, why would that be relevant? And aren't they entirely unrealistic? But I, I, I think they do show something. I think there's something deeply worrying about an agent who, and we can imagine, because I, I assume epistemic rationality is independent of what you desire uh, or value. So let's just imagine an agent who has your uh, states of belief over time, but you who only values money and values it linearly with, with monetary payoff, right? And then uh, there's something just deeply wrong about an agent who, who's only interested in making as much money as possible, who, who evaluates these deals correctly by expected utility uh, maximization. Uh, that seems to be the rational way to evaluate them, uh, but who nevertheless makes deals which are guaranteed to lose their money. Something has gone wrong. It's not the way they evaluate the deals. It's not their desires, which may be unrealistic, but aren't, you know, I think, irrational. So what's wrong is something with their beliefs. So I, I find Dutch book arguments in general, and, and in this case as well, to have some force. Of course, they don't prove anything, but, but they have some force. They, they illustrate that something has gone wrong. Well, and the last argument I have on the handout is really just repeating that you are uh, violating this uh, conservative principle, right? You have, you've changed your mind about whether you have hands, even though you receive no relevant information, and that just seems wrong. So I just want to highlight that the other arguments are a little bit tech technical, but there is, I think, just a direct sort of counterintuitive consequence of the evidentialist position here, uh, which says you should become neutral about whether you have hands. Because it is committed to this strange change of mind for no good reason. And that just seems, seems problematic. OK, so this was case one. And if you're already convinced that this is a, a good example to illustrate how evidentialism comes apart from this conservative principle and more generally from diachronic norms. You can get a coffee or, or think about something else. I'll, I'll go through two other cases which don't, which bypass some objections you might have or some worries you might have about this particular example where you might think, but I'm attracted to a version of evidentialism, which in this case says you should really remain confident that you have hands, right? So you haven't convinced me yet that you, here we have a clash. Uh, and so I have two other cases where maybe you'll, uh, you'll be more convinced that, that the, the clash can arise. Okay, but, and, but these are a little more complicated. So it's case two. So imagine you know that uh, the universe contains uh, a duplicate of our solar system. So this uh, duplicate, complete atom for atom duplicate, including duplicates of you and of all of us, right? Giving and listening to talks. Uh, now, in a, in a moment, uh, a giant alien spaceships will pass through one of these two solar systems, and you don't know through which, uh, and they'll people, those in, in, in that solar system will, will notice that this is happening because they will block the, the sunlight from reaching the Earth. Well, now it's too dark, but imagine it's, it's during the day and you would clearly notice that, uh, that the light of the sun is blocked. So that's go going to happen uh, very soon now. Once they've passed through the galaxy, these aliens will erase all traces of what has happened so that afterwards the two galaxies, are, so two solar systems are once again perfect duplicates. Just grant me that story. I know it's a very far-fetched and physically impossible story. We could make it more realistic. It would get more complicated. It doesn't really matter, I think. So let, just grant me this very strange story. Right? So 
at T1, T1 is the time now when the, the uh, giant spaceships pass through one of the two solar systems. And you're outside at T1, and it's during daytime, the sun is shining, and you notice that the sun is just as bright as normal. So you realize this, the aliens are not passing through your solar system. That's the time when you, when you find that out. And that is H, the aliens haven't chosen your solar system. And now time passes. T2 is maybe the next day or the next week, it doesn't matter, but it's long after this, the aliens have passed through the other solar system. And now let's look at your evidence at that later time. So maybe, maybe do the conservative thing first. I claim you should remain confident that the aliens did, did not pass through your solar system. Like you should remain confident in H. And the simple reason is again that, well, you, you haven't learned anything at time T2 uh, that's relevant. I, mean, I haven't told you what happens at time T2, but it, nothing really interesting happened. You went to sleep, you got up. You might not have learned anything that you didn't foresee you would learn. So you should remain confident by the conservative principle that the aliens did not pass through your solar system. And this is also uh, a consequence of, of my update rule, if you wanted to apply it to that case. But what about your evidence? Uh, arguably, your evidence at the later time, right, maybe a day or a week after this whole episode, really doesn't tell where, where, the, where the aliens went. Uh, now, again, this is not entirely trivial. It does depend a little bit on, on what you think the evidence is. But imagine, so imagine you have a friend who, who spent uh, the relevant time in a, in a, in a bunker where they, where they couldn't see the sunlight and whether it's blocked off or not. So at T1, your friend hasn't figured out, hasn't found out uh, whether the aliens pass through or not. And your friend emerges later at T2 maybe afterwards. From, from their bunker and now wants to investigate whether the aliens pass through this solar system or the other one. Now, clearly, whatever they would find is of no relevance to their question, right? So they, will, they could look at uh, footage from security cameras to see if the light was dimmed. Would that tell them that the aliens didn't, and they would find, oh, no dimmed light. Would that tell them that the aliens didn't pass through that solar system? Clearly not, because the footage uh, in, in the other solar system, where the aliens did pass through, also shows no dimmed light because all traces have been erased. Right? At T2, these two solar systems are perfect duplicates. So finding footage where there, it shows no dimmed light really is evidentially neutral. And similar for any other evidence your friend could acquire, they could interview you and they could interview other people. And the people would say, I did not see the light being dimmed. The people in the other solar system say exactly the same things. They're atom for atom duplicates. Right? They are being interviewed by the duplicate friend, and they're saying, I did not see uh, dimmed lights. So that is not, does not tell your friend anything. Uh, so wh whatever they could look at, whatever they could find, it would not shed any light on whether the, the aliens passed through that solar system or the other one. So if you have evidence that strongly supports the hypothesis, H, that the aliens did not pass through your solar system. This is evidence you could not possibly share with your friend. Because I think it's pretty clear that your friend, when they emerge, they, could, they have no evidence, they have no access to any evidence, assuming they can't time travel, right? that they would shed any light on whether H is true. And that seems strange, just, I mean, who knows how we should understand evidence, but if you think evidential wasn't here said you should remain confident in H, then the relevant notion of evidence is one that could not possibly be shared between you and your friend. Right? Because whatever you want to do, you, you could not convince your friend rationally that, that the aliens uh, didn't pass through, through your solar system. Uh, this case can also be, be changed into a case that bypasses another worry you might have about both case one and case two, which is that the non-H scenarios in both of these cases have a skeptical flavor. So in, in case one, I mean, it was obvious the non-H scenario, the scenario where you don't have hands, is a scenario where, uh, where you're braiding a bat, uh, and that's clearly a skeptical scenario. And here, the, the non-H scenarios, the scenarios where you are in the solar system where the aliens did pass through and had all your memory erased, has also this much, much less significant, but still somewhat skeptical flavor that your memories have been erased. So you have all these false quasi-memories of, of events at T1 that didn't actually happen. 
And you might think this somehow skews the situation. Maybe really we should, you might think, for example, these skeptical scenarios of any kind should always get credence zero, and then you would actually get the same result yeah, about these two cases as my rule. But it's easy to change uh, this case into one where I claim you should act actually give higher credence to a skeptical scenario. For example, uh, imagine you knew this all along. Uh, the aliens, uh, once they've passed through one of the two solar systems, they'll maybe a week later, they'll visit the other one and turn everyone in that solar system into a brain in a vat. That's what they'll do a week after they pass through the first, they come to the second. Now, I claim, and straightforwardly follows both by the conservative principle and my rule, that a week after you've seen that the sun is as bright as always, you should become confident that you are now a brain in a vat. Because that's what, what happens at, at the solar system where, where the sun was as bright as always at T1 a week later. So you should become confident that you're now a brain in a vat. So this would be sort of an extreme case where my rule says you should actually assign very high credence to a skeptical scenario because as it were, the, the dynamics uh, is such that you initially assign high credence to a normal scenario and you know that it'll turn into a skeptical scenario. And my rule says, well, just unless you receive relevant information, just keep believing that and move sort of the, the credence forward until you're in the skeptical scenario. Okay, uh, here's the third case. So this was the second case, here's the third case. Again, looks far-fetched is not so far-fetched in fact, because it's modeled on sort of the, a well-known puzzle about uh, Everettian quantum mechanics. Uh, but let's just not, let's not do it with quantum mechanics, but just with a, sort of a body copying machine. So imagine there are these machines, they're the body copying machines and, and they work as follows. A, a person enters into them and then 101 copies of that person uh, come out. Uh, perfect atom for atom cop copies of the person that went in. The original person is no longer there as a separate person. Their, their matter has been distributed over the 101 copies evenly. And of course, further matter is used to produce those copies. So that's how these, these uh, body copying machines uh, work. Familiar from debates in the metaphysics of, of personal identity. Uh, now, you've bought one of these machines. Uh, but you've bought it at a discount from a series in which almost all the machines are actually broken. 99% of all machines in that series are broken and you know nothing else about the one you've bought. All right, so hand out if, if your machine works, it will turn you into these 101 copies. And they emerge through output slots, one through 101 and the slots are labeled. Uh, so one, one slot says one, the other two and so on. It's a very big machine, I guess. So, and if the machine is broken, I can tell you that, uh, then you, you enter it and then you come out uh, through one of the slots completely unchanged and unduplicated, right? And uh, which slot you come out, maybe you don't know, or maybe it's an actually random event. At least you don't know where you will come out. Okay, T1 is the time when you enter your machine, and T2 is the time when you find yourself in slot 17 a little later. Oh yeah, I should also mention, while you're in the machine, you're unconscious. And so you don't, don't somehow realize what's happened. You just enter the machine, you become unconscious. Whether it works or not, that, 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 that part definitely works. So you enter the machine, you become unconscious, unconscious, you find yourself in slot 17. If you worry, but is it really you? Let me just add, this machine is in fact broken. So definitely it's you, right? Nothing has happened to you. But you don't know. You don't know, we can assume. At least it's not obvious that you know that the machine is broken. So you find yourself in slot 17. And now the question is, what should you uh, believe? This is a little more tricky because we now have this kind of fission scenario. Uh, and and, and I, I can tell you that my rule tells you, you, you should remain confident, in fact, 99% confident that your machine is broken. It's clear that that was the rational attitude at T1. When you entered the machine, you should be 99% confident that the machine is broken because all the, all the relevant information you have is it's from a series where 99% are broken. And my rule says you should remain 99% confident that it's broken. And one way kind of to see this uh, is if you apply the conservative principle, because it's hard to see how the information you get that, you're, that the, the slot you see is, is, has the number 17 as, as you find yourself at T2 is, is relevant. If, if that strongly, sort of, 
decreases the probability of H, then whatever else you would have seen would have done the same, obviously, right? There's nothing special about 17 being written on your slot, right? So if, uh, if, if you think that sort of what you learn is relevant, the, the learning, oh, I, I find myself in slot 17 is relevant to whether the machine is broken, then anything you could have learned is relevant. And that seems really weird, right? Because then if you know that tomorrow I'll learn something, which strongly decreases the probability of H. Whatever, whatever I will learn, I'm not sure what I learn, but I know already that it strongly counts against H being true. Then that seems really good. Then you should already decrease your current credence in H. So I think that's, that's a way of seeing that what you learn can't be relevant to H, which doesn't change its truth value over time, that this machine is broken or not. Uh, that if, if, if it were relevant, then you should already have adjusted to it before because you would already have known before that you're going to learn this relevant fact. Uh, but you clearly at T1, the rational credence is 99% is in H. Now, on the other hand, I think one can make a very strong case that the evidence at time T2 is neutral on whether the machine is broken or not. And again, one way to see this is to imagine that you have a friend with whom you can share the evidence. And the, the friend is standing at slot 17. Uh, and like you, when you're emerging slot 17, uh, your friend can't see the other slots, right? So I've assumed throughout, of course, that you can't see what's happening in the other slots. If you could see that nobody's appearing there, of course, you should become convinced that your machine is broken. So your friend, like you, is positioned so that they can only see what's happening in slot 17. Uh, your friend also knows about the frequencies that this machine is from a series where 99% are broken. Your friend has seen you enter the machine and now sees you or, well, someone who looks like you, right, uh, emerge in slot 17. Now, what should your friend believe? I think it's pretty clear that the information your friend receives as she sees you in slot 17 strongly decreases the probability of age. It strongly increases the probability for them that the machine works. Because think of if the machine works, then it's guaranteed that someone who looks just like you will appear in slot 17, right? Because if the machine works, someone just like you will appear in every slot. So conditional on the machine working, the probability of someone just like you appearing in slot 17 is one. Conditional on the machine being broken, the probability that someone just like you would appear in slot 17 is one over 101, right? Because there'll be a person appearing, but in one of these slots, equally likely, uh, one of the 101 slots. So uh, this is the kind of thing where you need Bayes' theorem to crunch the numbers, right? You can tell conditional on H, the, the machine is broken, the evidence has such and such probability, conditional on not H, it has this other probability. And I chose the number so that if you crunch the numbers with Bayes' theorem, you get exactly 0.5. That's why 99% and 101 have been chosen. Uh, so arguably the evidence you have, well, I think it's pretty clear that the evidence your friend has uh, supports H to, well, it, yeah, supports H to degree 0.5. So, uh, so, so if, if you have other evidence, uh, again, this would be the kind of evidence you couldn't possibly share with your friend, because clearly whatever you tell your friend, uh, it's not going to affect, be further relevant evidence that's relevant for your friend. Uh, so this is, again, one argument. Uh, I have some other arguments, but, but, but I'll, I'll skip those here. OK. So these were three cases uh, where that illustrate the possibility for a clash between uh, this very popular and often just assumed principle of, of evidentialism and, and certain diachronic norms, such as the simple principle of conservatism and also the, the uh, update rule I, I have defended. OK, I'll have a, a, a few more uh, minutes just to uh, respond to a certain motivation for favoring the evidentialist norm, despite the arguments uh, that I hinted at for why in those cases we should, we should favor the diachronic norm. What I found is that when people think about questions like these, they often imagine that the agent has a choice at, at the relevant later time, at T2, about what credence function to adopt? So that's the question they, they, they think is relevant here. So we ask, oh, here you are at time T2. What, what beliefs should you adopt? 
And rules like conditionalization seem to give you a strange answer. They seem to say, well, look, what you should do is take your previous credence function from time t1, conditionalize it on your new evidence, and then adopt the resulting probability function. And that seems kind of odd because it seems to presuppose, for one thing, that you have access to your previous credence function. Well, what if you don't? You might wonder, what if, what if I don't know what my previous credence function was? How, how could I do that? Also, even if you do have access to your previous credence function, if suppose you, you know, ah, my previous credence function was this function, uh, why should, should you give special treatment to that credence function? Right? So suppose you know that that was your previous credence function, and this one is Sophie's previous credence function, and Sophie is your epistemic peer or superior. Why should your new credence function completely disregard Sophie's previous credence function, but take yours to be the guiding one that should be updated on your new evidence? Why that? Why this favoritism towards your previous self rather than someone else, if you happen to know someone else's previous credence function? It just seems kind of weird. This is a point Christensen has made. And also, you might worry that conditionalization, as has often been noticed, is, is incompatible with losing information, right? with forgetting. And people often forget. People often sort of ha have information, and then later they forget about it. And it seems like we, we shouldn't want uh, a decision rule, an, an up, uh, sorry, we shouldn't want a, a norm of rationality that rules out forgetting. As, as Williamson said, forgetting is not irrational. It must be true, because Williamson said it. So that's the kind of, um, uh, these are the kinds of worries you might, you might have. And my response is that you started with the, the wrong question. I'm not asking, here you are at time t2, uh, here's, here's the evidence you have, here's what's available to you. Given all that, what credence function should you adopt? That's not my question. I think it's not a, a sensible question to ask. Uh, my question is different. I'm asking, look, here's your credence function at t1. I want to know how should this belief state, right, represented by that credence function, how should that belief state evolve over time as time passes and as new information comes in? That's the question I'm interested in, right? It's a question that's obviously relevant to like people in engineering or, or computer science who build you know, artificial agents, or it could just be a database, right? You want to know, well, how should the content of this database be updated over time, right? So there is a process of changing an earlier belief state or information state into a later information state. And it seems to me that that process, we can ask, well, how should that process go? And that's the question I want to, I want to ask. How should that update process go? And if that's the question we ask, you don't need to have access in some interesting sense at the later state to the earlier belief state. Right? It's, I haven't assumed when asking this question that your later information state somehow knows what the earlier one is. It doesn't matter. Right? The earlier one is the starting point of the process. And I want to know, and conditionalization is one possible answer to how that earlier state should change over time. Right? Conditionalize it on the, on the new evidence. It doesn't matter if this, this later agent knows what the earlier yeah, credence was. Also, it's obvious why the earlier credence function gets special treatment, treatment, right? As opposed to Sophie's or someone else's. It's the starting point of the process. I want to know how this credence function should evolve. Uh, there is no such process going from Sophie's earlier credence function to my later credence. What kind of process would that be? So I'm not interested in norms for how that process should look, because there is no such process. Right? That's the simple answer why, why I'm only interested in how the earlier credence function should evolve, because there just is no, no, no other process to be interested in. Also, from this perspective, I think we should reconsider Williamson's judgment that uh, forgetting is irrational. Because, you know, if I, I mean, in, in this context where we discuss conditionalization and these kinds of norms, we're, we're always imagining ideal Bayesian agents, right? So agents who have unlimited resources and cognitive power. And that's my context as well. I think it's a good and important question to ask what should sort of limited agents uh, do, what norms apply to them. Uh, and I think we should actually pay more attention to this question, but that's not the context here. I'm just thinking about idealized agents in ideal conditions. And in those conditions, I think it's pretty clear that if we ask how should an information state change over time, that we don't want uh, the inf some information to just be lost, right? So if the earlier, imagine, so we're asking this about databases. If the database contains some information at the earlier time, and then time passes, 
Uh, we don't want just to lose that information. I mean, maybe we want to lose the information if something else is learned in the meantime that conflicts with that information. But we don't just want to lose information. If we are asking how ideally should a database be updated over time, the answer should rule out forgetting. So forgetting is irrational in the sense of incompatible with an idealized, uh, what, what an idealized agent would do. So I think if we take seriously that it makes sense to ask this, this process question, this diachronic question, the question, how should that information state change over time or that belief state change over time, then uh, a, a powerful motivation for evidentialism loses its force. And that's this motivation that where you start at a later time, you think, oh, what belief function should I adopt? Oh, well, I have this evidence and, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, I think if we take seriously that there are these diachronic moments, this, this motivation, uh, at least uh, can be weakened. And I think it's very plausible that there are diachronic laws. It would seem entirely bizarre uh, for someone to think that uh, it, it's this, uh, from an epistemological perspective, irrelevant how a, an, an information state or a database is updated over time. You can sort of randomly throw out information here uh, and then randomly throw in other information here and you just look at sort of the internal coherence of the information state at different times. That's all that matters. That seems like it's obviously wrong. Right? Obviously there is sort of right and wrong or better or worse processes of how to update the database or a belief state. And I think it's not a coincidence that philosophers, some philosophers who have sympathies for evidentialism have also tried to defend what Sarah Moss calls time slice epistemology, which is the explicit denial of any diachronic norms uh, on rationality. I find the arguments very, very unconvincing. I have time to go through them here. I just also want to point out that the view is, is really uh, highly implausible. And uh, I have some arguments why, even if you're an evidentialist, you should reject this very implausible view. And conversely, however, even if you're a time slide epistemology, I think you still should reject evidentialism. But you can ask me about this in Q&A because I, I think I've already talked for too long. So the, uh, the, the main um, uh, po point I wanted to make is to make you, <laughs> convince you that there is really a tension. We have to choose between this very plausible sounding evidentialist principle, which is often assumed as a platitude or as a starting point for investigations in epistemology and plausible diachronic norms. And I hope I've also convinced you that there's at least something to be said for in those cases where they come apart, which is not very often, but there are such cases, we should go with the, the diachronic norms. Thank you. <laughs>